Would you stand with me as we read God's word this morning from the 18th chapter of Luke, reading beginning in verse 9. And he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Father, as we come to your throne of grace, as you so graciously call it, coming into your presence by prayer, so thankful that the way has been cleared by Jesus Christ. We could never dare come on our own. To pray in his name is to pray because of the path that he has made, the access that he has made for us to come. We come this morning with great added gratitude and we come with worship. We come with thanksgiving. We come with requests. For these things that are going on, for the, for the things that will be happening in the lives of those in our church, for the lives of those who are hurting or in pain or suffering from uh, whatever the difficulties are, need healing. We pray for that. We pray with thanksgiving for all of the things that you have done, Lord, and all the, all the many, many blessings that we have received as a congregation, as individuals. We pray that our minds will always be focused on the fact we did not deserve this. We did not earn this. We could not. Is all a gift from our loving Savior. May we never forget that. And Lord, now as we come to this wonderful passage of Scripture, such a tellingly clear passage of Scripture, help us not to goof it up. Please, Lord, help that the message will be crystal clear, as crystal clear as you have made it. And challenge us with it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. <clears throat> Turn with me to Luke 18, if you've not already, beginning in verse 9, that's where we will be. This is one of the most pivotal passages in all of Scripture, certainly one of the most pivotal parables that our Lord ever gave. This parable tells the gospel as clearly as it can be told. It tells it as clearly as it can be told. If you don't get it here, I despair that you would ever get it. This is the gospel on the bottom shelf, clearly available and accessible to all. Now notice who Jesus' audience is. Jesus' audience is those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This is a warning for anyone anywhere, at any time, who in any way feels like they have earned their way to God, that they have put God under obligation to them, that somehow God is in debt to them. That is never, ever the case. But these are those who thought that they were righteous in themselves. You know, it struck me as I was studying this, and we don't talk much about righteousness anymore, um, I, it makes you wonder, does the average person really care about being righteous? But you know what? I, let me tell you, actually, we do. We just have different words for it. We all want to be in. We all want to be accepted by God. We use different terms, but that is important to us. We don't exactly think about it that way, but that question lurks behind every action that we ever take. We can suppress it, we can reject it, we can deny it, but we cannot avoid it. Am I really acceptable to God? 
Am I in? Deep inside us, there is the undeniable need to be accepted, to be wanted, to be in, to be righteous. All of those things are just different ways of saying I need. All of our desires are different ways of expressing our need really for God. So this is the topic that Jesus is addressing in this very explicit parable. How to be righteous. Or in today's vernacular, we might say how to be free of guilt. How to be acceptable to God without a doubt. That's the topic. And because it's so important, I want to take... A little bit of time with this parable. This week I want to look at it in general terms. The next week we'll look at what it means to, to not be acceptable and then finally how to be acceptable. Eternal life and death, beloved, hang in the balance with what this parable is teaching us. So let's look at it today in general terms. First of all, the problem. The problem. There's a problem presented here. High school band was out on the field one day, and as they were playing the trumpet, one of the trumpet players stepped out to play a solo, and he was doing, I mean, just exceedingly well. His father was way up in the stands, couldn't stand it. You know, he just kind of poked his chest down, and he said, that's my boy down there, you know, to anybody who happened to be listening. And then all of a sudden, the notes begin to come out a little bit sour, I don't know whether somebody was eating a lemon in front of this guy or what, but I understand that can mess you up if you're a trumpet player. And the, and the, the notes just weren't coming out right. And the, and the father was up above. He looked down and he says, you know what? I, I think that, you know, I'm not sure that is my boy. They all look, they all look the same from up here. That would be devastating, wouldn't it? And yet I think that way down deep inside of us, there's the recognition that that's a little bit like, sort of like our relationship with God. Not because God is like that father, but because we are like that son. Not good enough. Not good enough. We all want to be accepted. We want to be accepted by our peers. We want to be accepted by our family. We want to be accepted by those we work with, by our boss, and most of all, by God. They are all expressions of a desire ultimately to be accepted by God. Beneath it all, we do want to be righteous. We may express it in different ways, but that is what we want. But there is also another very deep-seated recognition. It's the recognition that while we want to be righteous, we are not. We know that. It's another thing that we deny, that we repress, that we try to deep six, but the truth is we know that we are not. And that's what we call guilt. Now guilt, if righteousness is a word we don't think about, guilt is always on our mind. Let me tell you, guilt is on the minds of Americans. What is guilt? Guilt is the recognition that I'm not only am I not righteous, but I can't get righteous. And if you don't think guilt is an issue, if you think it's gone away, because we're basically told these days all guilt is false guilt, or at least most of it is. There's a little bit that's real, but most of it's false guilt. If you've bought into that, you need to recognize that we have a $50 billion plus industry in the United States trying to get rid of something that we say doesn't exist. That's, all, that's what it costs to go to therapists and counselors and psychiatrists. $50 billion. If you don't think guilt is real, listen to this from Carl Memminger, one of the a world famous psychiatrists. He says, if I could convince the patients in my psychiat psychiatric hospitals, now notice he said the patients, he's not talking about the average guy here who has a little guilt. He's talking about people that are overburdened with guilt. Listen to this. If I could convince the patients in my psychiatric hospitals that their sins are forgiven, 75% of them would walk out tomorrow. Guilt is real, beloved. Subconsciously, the whole world wants to be accepted, and subconsciously, we know that we are not. So why this doubt? Why do we have this concern that we really are not acceptable? I'll tell you why. Because it's true. 
We are not. We are not acceptable to God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the verdict of the scripture. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's the verdict of scripture. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's the verdict of scripture. No one seeks after God. That is the verdict of scripture. There is a huge gap between us and God, a grand canyon gap. That's how big it is. You know, the first time I was in Boston, had a car, rental car, and I'm driving around and I'm trying to figure out how in the world does anybody navigate in this crazy town. New York is simple. It's, you know, laid out on vertical streets and horizontal streets and there's avenues and there's streets and you can figure out exactly where you're going. Boston is a bunch of paved over cow trails. You know, New York does not have a river running right through the middle of it. Boston has the Charles River running right through the middle. I could see where I wanted to go and I could not get there. Right? Huge gap. Grand Canyon Gap. That's the way we are with God. God is holy and we are not. We can see it, but we can't be it. And so we have this Grand Canyon unbridgeable gap between us and God. We long to be righteous, but we cannot. So what do we do? Here's the human solution, and it is everywhere. It's everywhere. The human solution is simple. Lower the standard. Lower the standard. Aim at something lower. Define it as less than perfection. A few years ago, one of the customers that I worked with was the city of Houston. We supplied a lot of fingerprint identification, records management, computer-aided dispatch equipment to the city of Houston. And I was talking with one of the assistant chiefs in the city of Houston one day, and he was bemoaning some of the problems that he faced in his position. One of the problems was that they had been mandated by the city council to have a certain number of feet on the street, as you would expect. The problem was the money that was available to pay for people wouldn't pay for people that were qualified. So they kept trying to put feet on the street, but people that would come in that were qualified, when they found out what the salary was, would turn and walk out. So what did they do? They did the only thing that was available to them. They lowered the standards. This was true, I found out, of city after city after city across the country. Both the, both the physical and the, and the, and the uh, mental and the academic standards were lowered so that you could get people who would take these jobs. That was the problem Jesus ran into. People were, what they were doing? Look at it again, verse nine. He told them a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Were they righteous? No. Not even close. But what had they done? They had lowered the standard and then declared themselves righteous. Anybody can do that. God said, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not steal. And the Pharisees of the day, whom the people followed, said, okay, so you can't go in and rob a bank. But... I can take money over here that really should be for my elderly parents to support them in their old age so that I'm honoring my father and mother. I can take that money and give it to the temple where everybody will see how much I'm giving and I will be considered wonderful in the eyes of the people and so that's what I will do. And Jesus called them on it and said, you're nothing but thieves. God said, Thou shalt not murder. And they said, okay, so I can't stab somebody in the back, but I can stab them 
physically, but I can stab them in the back mentally and I can stab them in the back verbally anytime I want to. And Jesus called them on it and said, if you harbor grudges in your heart against somebody, you are a murderer. God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And they said, well, fine, but you can't be arrested for what you're thinking. And Jesus called them on it. He said, you're, you're lusting after somebody in your heart, you're an adulterer. You see, they were lowering the standards. That's why they could declare themselves righteous. They first took the law of God and then they defined it any way they wanted to so that they could fit it into what they thought they could do and against their standard, they declared themselves to be righteous. It never occurred to them that in redefining the law, they were actually creating a God in their own image, a God who is not real, a God you can call him what he want, whatever you want, but he's not the real God. He's not the God of the Bible. And while they might be acceptable to the God of their imagination, they were further from ever from the true God. This is what happens when we lower the standard. This is exactly why millions of people today continue to say, well, I'm as good as the next guy. I can't believe that a loving God would send somebody as good as me to hell. I'm good enough. I'll make it. Declaring themselves acceptable by their standards against a God of their own making. You know what they're doing? They're building bridges to nowhere. There's God on the other side of the Grand Canyon and they say, I will commit, I will commit myself to build my own bridge to God. I will get there. Meanwhile, God is still there living in perfection and they cannot reach him. That is a problem. That's the problem. Jesus is addressing people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, build, building bridges to nowhere, building bridges that went two feet out into the Grand Canyon where there are miles to get to the other side. That's a problem. That's the problem that Jesus is addressing here. You know what, we all have friends and loved ones and perhaps there's someone here this morning who has that problem. Anybody who's trusting in themselves has this very, very serious and damning problem. So Jesus addresses it with a parable. So there's the problem, now we look at the parable. Now we're gonna look at the parable in detail next week. It's a story that's aimed at their grave error. But I wanna set the stage for that with a kind of an introduction to the parable. There's something that's very important to understand about the parable because in the parable you noticed two people. And our tendency is to read that parable and say, okay, I got it. God is talking about the, the really good people and the really bad people, the evil and the just, and so that's what the deal is. But that's not quite what the deal is. Jesus saw the world divided into not, three, not two types of people, but into three types of people. Not two, but three. And this will help you understand much more of the New Testament, frankly, of the Gospels as you read through them. There are three types of people. Let's call them the irreligious, the religious, and the gospel people. Those are the three types of people. The irreligious people are the people who either don't believe in God at all, the whatever, 7% of the population that still says that, or they're the people, much greater percentage of the population, who believe there may be a God, but he doesn't matter. He's not involved in my life. He's not involved in people's individual lives. God doesn't matter, though he may exist. We cannot look to him for answers. We are basically living a meaningless life in a meaningless universe because God, whoever he is and whatever he is, doesn't care about me and doesn't care about this life. And so they write God off. Those are the irreligious people. Now, they may be some very good people. Penny and I ran into one of those this week that we were talking to in some detail. He was a man who was raised on religion when he was young. I don't know how old he was, probably our age. But somewhere along the line, when he got to the Citadel, which was the college he went to back in Charleston, South Carolina, 
He began to participate in some religious activities there, but something happened and we didn't get into detail. I wish I would have liked to have known more about what caused all this, but eventually he turned off to religion. Believe me, Pat, Patty was inviting him to church. You know, he should come to church sometime. She told him how great her husband was. I think that might have been the problem. He, he could look and see. She was trying her best. And he didn't want anything to do. Now, he was very kind. He said, listen, I understand you, I understand what you believe. I understand why you believe it. I appreciate that. No problem. But I just want to make it clear. You will never see me in your church or in any church. Now, that's a good person, beloved, but that's an irreligious person. He has written God off. Very sad. God tells us, Here's God's view on the irreligious person. It's in Romans 1. You can read the full details there sometime, but what he basically says is that by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. He basically says everybody knows there's a God. There are no real atheists. That's God's perspective. He's written the revelation of himself in every heart, and so you have to suppress that and repress that and deny it which is what this man was doing. That's how God looks at that. So the irreligious people live in denial. Well, they may understand a lot about this life, but ultimately about permanent, eternal things, they know nothing. They've written them off. Second group of people is the religious people. Who are the religious people? The religious people are those who believe that they can gain God's acceptance by doing something, by their works, by their rituals, by their mind games, whatever it may be. They believe that somehow they can reach out to God. They are, quote, seeking for God. They are the bridge builders to nowhere because all religion has this in common. All religion, doesn't matter, you can put whatever title you want to, to it, Muslim, Islam, Eastern religion, Buddhism, Zoroastrian, whatever you want. They're all doing one thing in common. They are all building bridges to God. This is what Genesis 11 is about. This is what the, you want to know what the story of the Tower of Babel is about? It's about, it's about the tendency of all mankind to try and build their way to God. What were they doing? They were building a tower to heaven. It's impossible, but that's what they do. This is the religious group. All religions, including Christian religion, when it is not the gospel, is doing the same. I, I, I can't tell you how many people are in church today counting on the ritual that they're going through to get them to heaven. It's nothing but a religion that goes nowhere. So who are the gospel people? The third group, the gospel people are those who have understood that the gap between us and God is unbridgeable by human means. It cannot be conquered with anything that people can do. It can only be conquered by the person of Jesus Christ. It can only be bridged by the shed blood of Jesus Christ as we celebrated this morning and as we read this morning in Galatians 3. That's the only way, that's the only bridge from one side to the other. That's the only, this is what the Bible was talking about in several places. Remember how Jacob saw the ladder that went back and forth between heaven and earth. What was that? That was God reaching down to man because man can't reach up to God. What was Nathaniel seeing when Jesus looked at him? He saw this same ladder between heaven and earth. Who was Jesus? Jesus was God coming down to earth because man cannot ascend to God on his own. It's all teaching the same thing. Do you see this? The gospel people have understood that and the gospel people have said, I give my sin to you in exchange for the gift of eternal life that you give to me. Now in this parable, all of that to say that in this parable, Jesus is not referring to the irreligious people. Most people make that mistake. That is not what he's doing. He's contrasting the last two categories. He's contrasting the religious people with gospel people. You will not understand this parable 
if you don't get that in mind. Now, we'll, again, we'll look at the details in the next couple of weeks, but we have to understand that's who he's contrasting. So we have two men here, we have two prayers, we have two people claiming to be believers, we have two people who want to get to God, but they have vastly different methods of getting there, and only one of them is declared righteous, and the other one is specifically declared not righteous. Very important to understand. That's the parable. Thirdly, we have the paradox. The paradox. There's a great paradox in this parable. This is hard to get because we've heard this parable so many times. You know, so we already know, those of you who have at least been around church, you already know what's going to happen. And, and so please, I don't know how you're going to do this. Try and pretend like you never heard of this before. <laughs> Try and pretend like you don't. You know, put yourself in first century Jewish shoes for just a moment, and I'll try and help you do that, because it's very important to see this. Here's the paradox. The paradox is that we have, first of all, a man who is in, in Jesus' parable as a Pharisee. Now, we know a little bit about the Pharisees because we've been seeing them all the way through the book of Luke, right? The, Pharisee, the word Pharisee meant separatist, and the reason they had that name is because that's who they were. They were separatists. They came into existence. It's a, it's a little foggy exactly what their history was, but they came into existence somewhere around 150 BC in the Jewish nation, and they, there were some people who began to, began to see the moral laxity that existed in the nation. They saw people going off toward all the philosophies of Greek as Greece had come into power and as Greek, Greece had invaded and actually had ruled in Israel for a little while. And so they had people that were compromising everything about the religion that God had given them. And they were, they were not only religiously lax, but they were morally lax. And so this group of men began to build up that were intent on keeping the law of God. And they were called separatists or Pharisees. Their whole goal was to keep the law. The problem was they ran into the same problem that everybody always does when they try to keep the law. You can do it for about five minutes. Maybe if you're, you're on a good day, if you're asleep, right? That's about it. That's, that's our max time that we can actually keep the law in every way, including in our mind and in our thought life. And they knew that. So what did they do? They began to define characteristics around the law. They'd take pieces of the law and they'd redefine it. And they ended up with 613 commands that they were doing everything they could to obey. They, they, these were commands that they literally could obey. Don't work on the Sabbath. Okay, so I can't carry a pin in my coat, so I'll get rid of all the pins. I, I can't walk more than 200, 200 yards away from home, so I won't go 200 yards away from home. And they had all of these rules, 613 of them, and they believed they could keep the law by keeping those. But what they had really done in the process was define the law of God out of existence. But they felt good about themselves. They believed themselves to be righteous. They hated the common people. They despised them. They saw, those as, they saw them as those who didn't even understand all the rules, let alone be keeping them. And yet the common people, even though they knew this, looked up to the Pharisees. They absolutely thought the Pharisees were the creme de la creme. They believed that these were the people who were the most pious that they could ever imagine. The Pharisees in that culture, understand this, wore the white hats. Now, I realize in the Gospels, they didn't, but to the people, they did. And you understand this parable if you don't understand that. When Jesus started talking about a Pharisee, and the Pharisee is the star of the parable, these people who heard the parable at the beginning would have thought, man, if there's anybody that's in, it's these guys. If there's anybody that is acceptable to God, it must be the Pharisees. So we have a Pharisee. Now in Jesus' parable, the Pharisee enters the temple to pray, right? The temple, of course, was this great thing that by that time Herod had been working on for 46 years. It still had another 16 years before it was finished. It had a big worship center in the center. that was the holy place, and then it had all these courts around it. It was a magnificent place, a place that the people could come and they could, 
You know, it was a kind of a cultural center for Jewish life. It was a place they could come for teaching occasionally. It was the place that they would come to worship. It was the only place that sacrifices could be offered. A lot of people don't understand that. There were synagogues, Jewish synagogues, all over the world at that time, but you could not come to a synagogue and offer a sacrifice. You could come and read the Bible. You could come and pray. You could come and sing, and they used to do all of that in the synagogues. Their services weren't all that different from ours, but you could not sacrifice. So to sacrifice... Anything, you had to go down to Jerusalem to the temple. It was the only place that sacrifices could be done. And so it was a major place of sacrifice. On feast days, of course, there were lots of sacrifices. On the celebration of the Passover, there were literally thousands, multiple thousands, sheep and goats and so on that were sacrificed. But on the average day, two sacrifices occurred at the temple. Two sacrifices, two times during the day when sacrifices were offered. And we get a little bit of an idea what happened during those times. In Luke 1.10, where Zacharias, the father of John, was offering, and it says, and the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the, at the hour of incense. People would come at the time the sacrifices were being offered, and that would be their prayer time. So when Jesus pictures a a, uh, a Pharisee coming to the temple to pray, undoubtedly this is what he had in mind. Here's what else he had in mind. When the Pharisees came to pray, they made a great show of it. They prayed long prayers. Now, I don't know how much they prayed. You know, people in those days stood when they were praying. That was generally the, the way in which they prayed. So when you came to the temple, you were liable to see a Pharisee and, you know, he would be there and he would be, you know, whatever his prayer stance was and he would be there and he would be there at the beginning of the sacrifice and he'd be there at the end of the sacrifice and you had no idea how long he'd been there. You also had no idea what he was thinking about. But he made a pretense of prayer. Jesus said in Luke 20, verse 47, they, for a pretense, they make long prayers. This is what Jesus has in mind. Now then there comes in the parable another man to the temple. He's a tax collector. Now just the idea of a tax collector coming to the temple was incongruous. It just didn't happen. No one would expect to see a tax collector in the temple. You remember again, we studied it before, the tax collectors were considered the scum of society. I mean, they were the lowest rung of the social rankings was the tax collectors. Why? Because they collected taxes. <laughs> That's not hard to figure out, right? And they did it for the Romans. And along the way, they feathered their own nest by collecting a little extra from everybody. And everybody knew they did it. Everybody knew they cheated, but nobody could change it because the Romans were behind the system. So the tax collectors were absolutely despised in that society. They were considered ceremonially unclean. It would have been another reason they couldn't come into the temple. They knew who they were. They knew the price they were going to pay for the stand they had taken. They had really, in the minds of the people and, and usually in their own minds, they had betrayed their people. They had betrayed their country. They had betrayed their religion. They had betrayed their God all for the sake of money. These were the tax collectors. Levi. Matthew was a tax collector before he came to faith in Christ. So here's this man who is a tax collector. His presence at the temple is a scandal. He wore a very black hat. That's what you have to understand. So when Jesus begins this parable where he's going to talk about who's righteous and who's not, there's no question in the doubt, uh, no doubt in the minds of his audience who's in and who's out. So both men pray. And then Jesus issues a verdict in verse 14. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, which is the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, really quick grammar point here. The word justified is a noun form of the word that's translated righteous back up in verse 9. Okay, so they're the same word. Righteous, justified. To make it simple, understandable to us, just substitute the word accepted in those two places. And now read it. In verse 9, 
He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were accepted or acceptable. So those who have self-justified have lowered the standard and declare themselves to be acceptable. Jesus knows that most people in the crowd think that not only are the Pharisees in, but so are they. So he tells this story and then he issues the verdict in the end, at the end of verse 14 and he says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector went down to his house, accepted rather than the other. And of course, there's the paradox. The one that Jesus says is in is the exact opposite of the one the crowd thought would be in. How could that possibly be? Now you have to stop and ask yourself a question at that point. Was the Pharisee out because of his goodness? Was it, was it his piety? What is, was it all the outwardly good things that he did that made him unjustified, that made him not righteous? And was it the dereliction, you know, the betrayal of nation, God, and country on the part of the tax collector that made him in? Is that what was going on? And of course the answer is no. The point Jesus is trying to make is, is really simple. It's what is inside that counts. And one had never come to repentance. One was counting on his outward stuff to get him in. He's going to be the same as Paul in Philippians 3. Here's what I was. I was, a tri you know, I was the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was circumcised the eighth day. I had everything going for me. He said, I counted it all but loss for the sake of Christ. You can't bring, beloved, your partially finished bridge. Think of it another way. Faced with a crowd who had the wrong idea about who was in and who was out. Jesus said, let me, let me show you two photographs. One of these photographs represents somebody who is acceptable to God. The other represents somebody who is not acceptable to God. The whole crowd would have said, it's the Pharisee. He's the one that's in. And Jesus is saying, it's not the Pharisee. It's the tax collector who is in. Not because he's a tax collector. Not because he has betrayed God and country. But because his heart has come to a point of repentance. Repentance. Because he's willing to say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He is the portrait of the one who is acceptable. Listen, clearly, beloved, religion looks good at the very same time that it's destroying people and sending them to hell. The picture of the Pharisee outwardly would have looked so much better. Jesus' message here is that our search for acceptance must center in him, not in us. Our search for acceptance must center in Christ, not in me. The best I can do is build a bridge to nowhere. Jesus is the only one who can bridge the gap between me and God. Let me illustrate this. I read recently of a woman, who she was in her late 30s, She'd been, you know, dating the same guy for some number of years. I don't remember how long it was. Ten years, something. Some, you know, a crazy period of time. And she was totally fed up with the relationship. He would not commit. Didn't want to get married. And she did. So she went to a therapist. A counselor. And the counselor said to her, well, let me just tell you. You know, you will, if, if you are looking to find acceptance... From, from, a, from the affection of a man, you're looking in the wrong place. You never find it there. You need to do something else. Jettison this guy. Go get yourself a career and prove to yourself that you're worth something without having the affection of a man. Well, sounded pretty good. Wasn't anything she had done. The therapist convinced her that you know, having a husband and having children wasn't the end all, wasn't the way to be accepted. She should go out and prove herself in the world of work. And so she did. She did that. 
But about the same time, she began to attend a church that preached the gospel, where the gospel was truly represented. Always up till this time, she had thought the way to get right with God is to amass a whole bunch of good works and then bring them to God, just like the people in Jesus' time thought. And as she heard the gospel, she began to realize it's not amassing good works on my part that's going to make me acceptable to God. It's, the, it's, a, it's, it's accepting the good works that Jesus has already amassed for me that will make me acceptable to God. And she came to faith in Christ. Jesus had already created the perfect record that was needed. But as she realized that, he had come to give her life, he had come to die, to be raised again from the dead, all for pay the penalty for her sin and make her right with God to be acceptable to the Father. At the same time, she realized that while the counselor may have been right about, you're not going to find your ultimate acceptance in the love of a man or in the affection of, a, of whatever your boyfriend is or your girlfriend or whoever else at the same time, but she also realized there's something else. The counselor may have been right about that, but she was certainly wrong about the fact that you're going to find acceptance in your career. Here's the way she said it, and it's beautiful. So listen carefully, because she got it. She said this. She said, why should I leave the ranks of the many women who make family their whole life to join the ranks of the many men who make career the same thing? Would I not be as devastated then by career setbacks as I have been by romantic ones? No. I rest in the righteousness, acceptance, of Christ and learn to rejoice in it. Then I can look at males or career and say, what makes me beautiful to God is Jesus, not these things. That's what Jesus is saying. Anything else is bridging, a, making a bridge to nowhere. Anything else is trying to find acceptance in all the wrong places. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a relationship. It doesn't matter whether it's ambition. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, turning off and what was, what was the words Timothy Leary used to say? Turn on, turn out, and bug out or something. I forget the exact words. My generation. It was just another religion. It was just a way to build a bridge by being irresponsible. It doesn't matter. The, the, every, anything, that's, anything less than Christ is a bridge to nowhere. Do you get it? That's the paradox. You know, the paradox is it just seems like I should be able to do this on my own. And Jesus is saying, I'm telling you, you can never do it on your own. It can only be the relationship with Christ, the paradox. Then we finally have the principle. The principle. Jesus closes with this at the end. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There's the paradox stated in the form of a principle. And the principle is really meaning this. To be accepted by God, you must do the opposite, the absolute opposite of what your human tendency is going to be, which is going to be to earn your own way, to create your own merit, to create your list of things that you're going to offer to God and now God has offered to do for you because you did this for him. <laughs> I mean, if you just think about it for a minute, if God is truly the creator, do you really think you can put God under obligation to you? Really? How brain dead are we? That's why Jesus says the only way to get to God is to get on your knees in humility, confess your inability, confess your sins, confess your idols, Determined to turn away from them and turn to him and beg for his mercy. Healing will come when you do that. Heading down is the way to go up. Heading down will bring you up. Heading up will bring you down. I heard uh, one time when John MacArthur was preaching, he talked about Actually, I think I read this in a book, actually. His sister passed away of cancer in 1997. He said, I spoke to her frankly on the phones. They were 
lived far apart. And he said, I spoke to her frequently in her, in her last days. One of those days he told her this. He said, well, Julie, the worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that could happen to anybody. <laughs> and that good to know. The worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that can happen to anybody. She replied, I know that. I never questioned it. I can't wait to be with Jesus. The next day when he talked to her, she said, I want to tell you something. She said, the, uh, she said the, uh, they, the, you know, they have, a, they have a therapist here at the hospital. He came by yesterday and he brought somebody else with him and they, they tried to get me to come and join this special therapy group. They told me I, it would help me get in touch with my inner child. John said, what'd you tell him? She said, well, I told him, no thanks. I, I don't need to get in touch with my inner child. I'm in touch with my Lord Jesus Christ and everything is fine. Are you in touch with your Lord Jesus Christ? Beloved, your inner child is not the answer. Your inner child is the problem. Jesus is the answer. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you know Jesus? Pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful parable. I pray that somehow the clarity of it will penetrate any foggy minds that hear it today or hear it online later or whatever. Lord, would you just please remove the blinders? I know the blinders are there because Satan puts them there. I know that you are the only one who can remove them. It won't be our logic and it won't be our uh, presentation, but the Holy Spirit can do that. And he uses the word, and here's the word so clear. Would you please remove blinders that perhaps have been there for years and years and years and years. Just take them away. Help us to see the beauty of Jesus. Help us to see the absolute wonder of what it means that Jesus became a curse for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. And then help us to reach out in faith and take that gift of eternal life that you offer. Pray it with all of my heart in Jesus' name. Amen.